okay um good morning good afternoon good evening everyone um so i think uh, you are having a great session uh, so i was connected from the morning and then uh, listening to other speakers uh, very insightful so what i'm going to do actually focus on one part of this story uh, that's about the apis and how api will help to uh, expedite the innovation and then get the uh, actual outcome that you are looking from these uh, systems that you are building, um, as well as uh, APIs are the connectors. And I'm going to connect uh, the innovation and the cloud native topic that Eric uh, explained uh, in detail. Um, so I would like to start uh, my session with uh, this uh, quote about uh, software industries like moving industry. I used to tell this a lot. Um, so uh, why I use this analogy? Because I see many uh, uh, parallels between these two industries. I think uh, Robert and Greg had a great conversation about uh, the impact of software, interest about software. Um, and I think even if you go and look at uh, uh, Sanjeev, our CEO's uh, LinkedIn profile. Uh, his uh, mission is basically to make a better world with software. So software is um, uh, playing a huge role in the current context, uh, as well as uh, Mark Anderson um, made a quote some time back that software is eating the world. So uh, so uh, getting back to software and uh, movie industry, so the, the parallels that I see, both industries are looking to provide a seamless experience for uh, the consumers. That when you go to a, a theater before pandemic, now in front of your TV, uh, after you watch a movie, what you are expecting is a great uh, experience from that. Even software, it is same that people are looking for a, a better experience from uh, the uh, uh, software they access, they use in day-to-day -day basis. And both industries um, uh, take a huge team effort to uh, produce these end results. And it's basically taking idea into um, some uh, production activities in software. We call it as the development life cycle. And then we make a release. And after we release, even software is used to reproduce by um, looking at the feedback from the people and uh, software also going through the same life cycle that we call it as the iterative process that you uh, create uh, the software again and again by getting the feedback from the users. So the uh, if software industry and uh, the movie industry having this close relationship, uh, then I pick another quote from a filmmaker and author, uh, Gerd Lennart. Uh, so he basically said, the customer of the future are not asking for efficiency. They want experiences, happiness, and relationships. So I intentionally um, cut the future part because it's not future, it's today. Like even today, uh, this is the... Um, uh, this is what consumers are expecting. And I think pandemic did uh, increase that uh, need based on various reasons. So if you look at how we came here, uh, these uh, goods uh, converted into services with uh, several delivery models, and then it moved to uh, some customization, personali personalization, and started providing an experience. And today we are even extending that experience economy into a more transformation um, uh, stage. That is what uh, uh, the organizations like Capital One, um, uh, Nordstrom, that are trying to provide. And the best example about this uh, experience economy is about Starbucks. Like if you look at the actual cost for a cup of copies, a coffee is less than $1, but we pay around $5 for that particular experience. People we meet inside the coffee shop and then the free Wi-Fi we get and then charging stations that uh, environment uh, that we get inside this uh, uh, coffee shops is what we pay highly and that's our expectation there as well that is how the the market dynamics or the uh, market outlook uh, looks like today and even the products are changing with that most of the time we go and access a product from a app store like it can be apple app store or it can be android store uh, various um, uh, app stores based on the 
platforms that you are using not only that like even buying a vehicle is a totally different experience right usually in the traditional way we have to go through a uh, uh, dealer and then go negotiate check the vehicle do the test driving and get the uh, purchase the vehicle after that it's it's a huge process and then not that uh, uh, kind of an entertaining process as well but today if you take some of these uh, uh, vehicles especially uh, as example tesla like you can just sit in front of your computer uh, go check uh, and pick the correct model configure the model based on your need and uh, purchase by swiping the credit card. And when the vehicle is ready, uh, agent from the uh, produce, pro provider will come to your home and deliver the vehicle. The experience, uh, it doesn't end at that point. Even after you purchase and become a consumer of the vehicle, you get um, updates on daily basis, monthly, based on uh, the improvements that they are making to the vehicle as well as the other capabilities that they are providing around that particular experience that you are getting. So that is how the uh, product experience looks like. And I think when pandemic started, uh, uh, there was an issue to go and shop for uh, groceries and Instacart uh, came into the picture and then they created a platform for any um, grocery store to uh, make that uh, there are uh, purchases available through uh, Instacart to purchase as well as deliver to your home. So that's another good example of uh, the experience people are looking in the uh, current economy. So with that, what happened, the traditional industry supply chain uh, changed into the digital supply chain. So the, the traditional supply chain starts with sourcing, manufacturing, uh, distribution, sales, and consumption. So that is the uh, usual supply chain steps that go in a sequential manner. But digital supply chain is um, uh, slightly different. It starts with the discovery phase. Like you look at a lot of uh, market research, uh, feedback, and um, uh, many data sets and uh, discover about the uh, capabilities required for a specific product, what kind of a product that you should build, all these things uh, identified during that discovery phase. Then it move into development. I think in between there are design, architecture, those type of uh, things get involved, but you move into the development state and you develop these digital applications. Then you deploy these digital applications in a cloud infrastructure, or if you have compute power inside, um, like uh, Eric explained about these large data centers that we used to have, uh, you deploy it inside these uh, compute, uh, I mean, uh, the data centers or in a cloud environment. Then uh, it's available for the customers. You do your marketing campaigns and then let the world know that you have a product like this. Then people will come navigate and based on the need, they will register. Um, so usually most of the services provide a uh, free tier uh, to kind of discover and then uh, they will uh, go to the uh, uh, buy a subscription and start getting the actual benefit of the product or the service. That's the experience stage. And it doesn't stop there. That's why it is sequential. But then again, it will come back in an iterative manner. So you get the feedback and go to the discovery phase again and improve certain set of features or add new features to your product based on the feedback that you are receiving. So the uh, so I would like to take another quote that Jeff Lawson, the uh, CEO of Twilio, who wrote this book, uh, Ask Your Developer. Uh, so he said, uh, if your digital supply chain is better than your competitors, you will be in a much stronger position to succeed. I think Sanjeeva explained uh, in the morning about uh, the innovation and then the differentiators that you create. So I think when you identify those differentiators, if you have a very efficient digital supply chain inside the organization, you can quickly deliver these uh, products to your customers and um, be more competitive in your market. So the uh, we looked at the products, we look at the experience, 
and we identified software is the one who's making it. So if you look at it in detail, or uh, if you do a, a kind of a deep dive into what's really happening inside the providers who's providing this digital experience, it looks like this. You connect these systems. So that is where the digitization and digitalization come into the picture that you move from analog into digital first and then start connecting these digital systems or digital endpoints. That's where this network of systems coming into the picture. So now it is not only inside the organization because you can't survive or you can't provide a seamless experience for your customer um, if you are not connected with your ecosystem. As an example, if somebody buys something from uh, your uh, website they are expecting to get it delivered as well and if you are not providing the delivery capabilities you have to connect with that delivery network and give that end-to-end -end experience for your consumer so that's where this connectivity coming into the picture so uh, once you're connected how you can use this connectivity or the integrations effect effectively and efficiently is where the APIs are coming, mean, not only effectively and efficiently, even securely. Uh, so the APIs will um, come in there and then start making the glue or the connections in between these systems. And now you can build products on top. So the products can be a web application or it can be a mobile application or it can be an edge or a IoT uh, type of an experience that you are providing through some kind of a device. It can be a vehicle, it can be a gas station or it can be a refrigerator. Anything that supports uh, these type of capabilities can be the edge device and we call it as an omnichannel experience that consumers are looking at. That's where the Digital products are coming. So digital products are providing that experience to the end users. And that's where you can benefit to the organization. And you started, uh, you, you are going to start uh, feeding into the value stream with that experience and connecting business and technology. So if you look at the APIs, usually people uh, have many dashboards about number of API calls happen and number of uh, uh, transactions done through these APIs, uh, so and so forth. But if you convert those API calls into dollar values, you will see this um, uh, impact to the value stream or impact to the business clearly uh, from the API platforms that you are building. So that is how at the first level, APIs will connect to the user experience and then uh, the innovation because the innovation that you are doing is about uh, creating great experience and how APIs will come to this uh, particular equation is what uh, I'm trying to highlight in this diagram. So uh, let's uh, get into the details now. You, we had a high level look at how APIs will come into the picture. So this is a detailed look. If you look at the architecture inside the uh, these organizations who's building these digital systems, uh, it either take this layered centralized architecture that we used to use from a long time, like uh, when 3D architecture came into the picture, we started working on this layered architecture and then it got improved. And um, we are in the age of like microservices and decentralized architecture like uh, we see in the right hand side of the screen um, but uh, if you look at both diagrams you will see these different layers in the left hand side diagram and different uh, components in the right hand diagram connects through apis i have categorized these apis to kind of have a proper governance uh, inside these uh, architecture diagrams. So the utility APIs, domain APIs, and edge APIs. Basically, the utility APIs are the one that provide data and then other common shared capabilities. And then domain APIs are the one uh, which provide capabilities through these domain services. Um, the term domain came with domain-driven design because a lot of systems are uh, designed using domain-driven design, um, including microservices. Uh, and then the edge APIs are the one that sit in between the end use applications and your uh, domain APIs. So the uh, right hand diagram even same that these capabilities from the services or the components that you can see exposed through 
APS. And if you are interested about uh, reading more, I have put a URL. You can go to this URL and read about these two reference architectures, centralized uh, reference architecture and decentralized reference architecture. The common thing about these two approaches, both are API centric. So the APIs uh, are the products of the 21st century because uh, you build end use applications, but uh, you can quickly or rapidly build these applications if you have a API architecture, a rich API architecture like I uh, explained in the previous slide. And this didn't happen like overnight. It happened uh, during uh, a long period that we were using APIs for a long time. We were using like pure technical APIs. And then it became semi-technical APIs. Um, a very interesting era like with COBA, COM, COM plus, DCOM, those type of distributed uh, computing technologies. Then the service-oriented architecture came with a lot of uh, different kind of APIs. And then uh, in 2011, 2012, uh, we were looking at this managed APIs or the concept of API economy, business of APIs came during this time period. So I would like to uh, give credit to two people, actually Sam Ramji, who used to work as um, uh, uh, API evangelist at uh, APG during that those days, as well as our API evangelist, uh, uh, Kin Lane, who's now working for Postman, they started uh, evangelizing about uh, business of APIs during 2011-2012, and we moved uh, to a different uh, stage and started working on this managed APIs. Then uh, uh, REST was the common uh, standard during that time uh, over HTTP, and we moved to other protocols like AMQP, MQTT, during those days as well. Now we are in the API product stage with many other technologies, like you will see uh, many uh, API standards are coming, like OpenAPI, gRPG, GraphQLs, Async APIs, many like uh, low-level technical standards as well as API specifications coming because the usability and the experience application developers are looking from APIs are changing and are really demanding. So as API provider, you have to cater all these capabilities and provide a um, set of APIs for APIs to be used heavily inside your organization as well as outside your organization as well. So these products, like uh, there are many use cases. If you look at uh, the industry, based on the domain and based on the maturity level, as well as uh, what they are expecting or the business expecting from technology, uh, these uh, different, uh, uh, the usage of these API products vary. So the first uh, level is like directly monetizing that you kind of sell API directly. I think Twilio is a really good example that they provide many APIs for various communication um, uh, communication mechanisms, like if you talk to a developer today and then ask how I can send SMS from uh, a particular application, they will say, oh, well, uh, I'm using Twilio API and then sending that. So it's that easy. That's about the direct monetization. And then the indirect monetization, you don't sell the APIs directly, uh, but you generate revenue on top of APIs indirectly. I think that's the most common use case these days that you will not see many public API portals, but you will see many private API portals due to that. And then the combining physical and digital is another uh, use case that most of these analog or um, non-digital related application systems as well as uh, the, um, uh, the other, other things that is not digitized, they can connect using uh, APIs as well. And the other use cases, uh, APIs are dealing as the backbone for digital transformation and API products. And uh, I think you might be building these digital platforms. And if you look at these digital platform, there's a core, uh, as uh, Sanjeev explained about the core and the context. Uh, so the core is basically APIs integration and security in most of the digital transformation uh, platforms that you are building and everything else like uh, AI, machine learning, dashboards, all these nice to 
have features are coming around that. And if you have a rich uh, API ecosystem inside these digital platforms, you can bring all these other capabilities. So these are a few examples of how you can use API as a product and link with a uh, business site. Then you need a marketplace uh, to uh, sell products, right? In the real world, you go and buy a marketplace. Marketplace is a really nice experience that you have a lot of conversations and it's a community and you exchange these things. So with that, like you create a, a different type of business models within the marketplace, like it's a, uh, it can be an internal federated marketplace, different business units exposing these APIs to a, a single marketplace and shared inside the organization. And it can be a partner market marketplace that you and your partners will have a common marketplace and you share those APIs inside that. And it can be a closed group marketplace as well, like you will allow certain set of APIs or certain type of APIs can be uh, published as well as consumed by a specific set of users. Then a shared revenue marketplace that you have a common marketplace, but uh, the, uh, the revenue that you generate will be shared based on who's providing, what kind of capabilities and uh, different type of categorization. In the aggregator marketplace is another uh, common feature that you combine different type of API. So you do API composition and this composite APIs will be uh, re, uh, shared inside this aggregator marketplace as well. So this is how uh, some link between the, uh, the generic lifecycle management of products and APIs will connect. Like product lifecycle management, we can directly link to API product management and ERP and financials that we used in uh, typical supply chain can connect to API insight and monetization. Then the supply chain management can connect to API integration and enablement as well as logistics. Uh, is a good example that we can map to API DevOps and lifecycle management of a API as well. So the uh, second part is about the cloud native. I think Eric uh, gave a really good talk about the, uh, the cloud uh, and the impact of the cloud today. And I would like to say cloud native development is a cultural mind shift beyond technology because you have to have the correct mindset and strategy to leverage cloud. And if you look at these statistics from um, CNCA for Cloud Native uh, Computing Foundation, there are around 6.5 million cloud native developers, and uh, most of them are using Kubernetes, uh, like uh, Cassie Hightower, a friend at uh, Google, once said, uh, Linux, uh, sorry, uh, uh, Kubernetes is becoming the Linux of networking. Uh, so it's around 2.7 million usage in uh, the uh, Kubernetes. Uh, world and then like around 60 percent developers are uh, consuming uh, containers at different stages and even there are large systems running on top of containers as well and this uh, the technology has uh, improved a lot and it is very um, crowded and you can see wso2 they are in the cncf technology landscape as well, and this is how the APIs connect with uh, connect with the um, cloud native uh, era. Basically, is the virtual machines and uh, the uh, traditional VMs we use more to containers and Kubernetes, and everything is API led, decentralized integration today. And we see APIs everywhere, from the infrastructure level into uh, the uh, uh, the application level and end user level, all these APIs are there. And API gateways from centralized uh, uh, architectures move into edge gateways and micro gateways today. And event driven architecture is heavily used. That's why the event driven APIs are very useful. And things are getting really lightweight because uh, to get the uh, maximum out of the containers, you need lightweight runtimes. And as Manoj mentioned in the earlier session, having open source offering uh, is very important. So you can kind of uh, quickly download and try these things. And you are moving from a CapEx to a more OPEX model, like a pay-as-you-go model. So that is how the uh, impact of the APIs with cloud native and how you can uh, utilize 
uh, the maximum out of cloud using APIs. So uh, to summarize, like uh, there are federation and business models available, and uh, you can leverage cloud heavily with the API first design, and uh, things are very polyglot and heterogeneous. You need different kind of APIs, like a request response, streaming event using various technologies, and uh, the, you can utilize the development and deployment capability is provided by these containers and container orchestration systems. Uh, that's how you can connect this API of business and API of technology that I call it as content duality of API uh, business and API as a technology. So uh, the, the uh, um, last but not least, I would like to highlight uh, you need a complete API management platform to do all this stuff. Just running an API gateway will not help. That's where you need end-to-end -end capabilities. And that's where we, as a technology company, come in here, providing complete API management uh, capabilities on-prem, as well as as a SaaS offering with Curio. And I highlighted about the security side. You need to have a secure environment, as well as secure set of APIs to uh, give the seamless experience for the end users. That's where our identity servant as Guardio coming into the picture. And not only that, that we have uh, vertical specific stuff that next session is about that as well. And my colleague Mifan will explain about uh, our open healthcare uh, platform. And in case if you need to have a strategy uh, to uh, build these API capabilities, uh, we are there to help you as well through our strategic consulting.